go together. So, all right. Um, full disclosure, this is very much a work in progress. So I appreciate you coming. I hope it won't be too chaotic, but I'm hoping that your excellent input will help make this a great talk. Um, so, um, in typical emotion research, right, people tend to talk about emotions in terms of, you know, you experience either anger, you experience sadness, you experience fear, but one emotion at one time, right? So, you either experience fear, you're either upset, or something like that, right? Of course, we all have this experience sometimes of seemingly experiencing several emotions at the same time or being ambivalent about how we feel, but that tends not to be talked about very much in the emotion theory, in, in emotion theory, right? So most emotion theories proceed as if an emotion is a very clearly demarcated event. It has an identifiable beginning, an identifiable end, and it occurs, as it were, alone, right? Without the interference of other emotions. So what this talk is about is about the fact that actually that is false. I think we all have experiences with seemingly experiencing several emotions at the same time or more or less at the same time. Um, and then I want to think a little bit about what that, what the implications of that are. So, um, in my thinking, I'm pretty clear about the, the three cases that I have, right? And then my final speculations are, um, speculative, speculative speculations. Only a philosopher will do this. But, okay. All right. So, um, there are three pairs of emotions that are very typically experienced at the same time. So, personal distress and sympathy or empathic concern. So, if you come from psychology, you will hear a lot about personal distress and empathic concern. In philosophy, we tend to, t to call empathic concern sympathy and Personal distress, we tend to call empathic distress. I'm going to say a little bit about why that is in a minute. But um, even though people and philosophers in particular, if you know any of the empathy literature, you will know that people love drawing distinctions, right? And saying, oh, you know, it's so confused the field because empathy is defined in so many ways and so forth and so on, right? Um, as if there is just one typical emotional reaction you have in one situation, even though most of the psychological literature actually suggests otherwise. People tend to experience these at the same time or at least during the same extended emotional episode. Shame and guilt is another pair that is very classically experienced at the same time or during the same emotional episode. And sometimes if you talk to people about where, what their idea is about shame or guilt, they are often a little confused about, well, what is shame exactly and what is guilt exactly, right? So there seems to be a sort of blending together of these emotions as well. And lastly, I'm talking about grief and relief. Um, it turns out that grief involves seemingly many different emotions. Um, one of which is relief, right? It's not invariably, uh, they're not invariably co-experienced, but very, very, it's very, very common to experience it both at the same time or during the process of grieving, just as these other emotions. So then there's an interesting question, why do those emotions go together? And then if they go together, does that teach us anything are there any interesting consequences for how we think about emotions? So let's start with personal distress and 
um, sympathy or empathic concern. So if any of you are familiar with the empathy literature, you will know that one of the big guys in the emotion, in the empathy literature, is Dan Batson. His work on the empathy altruism hypothesis, for instance, is a big deal for philosophers who are thinking about whether altruism actually exists. But a lot of his studies are studies that are widely uh, quoted by people who are interested in empathy and the effects of empathy. Um, Batson typically makes a distinction between what he calls personal distress and empathic concern. Um, and the standard story is that if people experience more empathic distress when they're exposed to a person in need, and it's easy to escape the situation where you are exposed to the other person in need, then they tend to escape the situation. That is interpreted in the following way. A big st distress response gives rise to egoistic motivation, and then you leave the situation. Because it turns out that if you're high in distress, and for instance, you're in a room where a subject is receiving electrical shocks, right? And they're, ex they're, I mean, obviously they're collaborating with the experimenter and so forth and so on, right? It doesn't get too bloody because you can't these days. Um, but, you know, the person will express a lot of discomfort. And usually when you're exposed to a person who expresses a lot of discomfort, you will feel some kind of distress as well, right? Um, people who experience personal distress or a lot of distress will tend to leave the situation if they're given the option, right? So, for instance, you might be told, look, um, this person has an abnormally strong reaction to these kind of shocks. It's because of a childhood trauma, whatever. They're really not that bad. You can take that person's place now and take the shocks instead of them, the next five or 10 shocks, or you can just leave, right? If you're high in personal distress, then you will tend to leave as opposed to taking the shocks. If you're high in sympathy or empathic concern, you will tend to take the shocks and not leave the situation. However, if you're being given the option of like, well, you can take the shocks or not, but you have to stay and watch the next round of shocks, if people are high in distress, they will actually tend to take the place of the other person rather than see them undergo the distress, right? So the, the standard story is something like, oh, um, distress is bad generally because it leads, leads to egoistic motivation. So even though these people are stepping in and helping the other person, they're really not doing it for altruistic reasons. They're just like, well, I can't stand watching this person in pain, so I will just take on the pain myself, right? Versus people who are more sympathetically concerned or empathic, empathically concerned. Um, they are actually motivated by altruistic reasons, or so the story goes, right? And that seems to create a very nice picture. If you're experiencing distress, then this is the type of motivation that you will have, and then you will have, you know, you will tend not to help a person in need if it's easy to escape, or if you experience empathic concern, then you will tend to help the person in need, um, and, and your motivation will be altruistic. But it turns out, of course, that that's a simplification. The story is more complicated. Why? Because when you expose people to another person in need, everybody will report experiencing both. They both feel distress and they feel um, sympathy. <laughs> 
There's actually additional studies that suggest that the two go together during a typical empathic episode. And actually, the work here of Carrera and Lopez Perez and Grinberg suggests that what matters is actually whether you feel more empathic concern at the end of a whole empathic episode when it comes to altruistically helping and not whether at any point during the episode you feel more empathic concern, right? Which means you can start out feeling extremely distressed, but as long as you end up feeling more concerned or more sympathetic towards the person, then you're more likely to help, right? So that's, um, that's a complication. Moreover, one of the most typical measures of empathy, the interpersonal reactivity index, uses this kind of distinction between empathic concern and personal distress that we've seen very much in Batson as if they were just two very separable episodes. Now, how, what is, you might ask, this personal distress and this empathic concern? Now, Batson doesn't ask directly, whoa, are you experiencing more empathic concern? Are you experiencing more distress? Instead, he presents these kinds of emotion words to people, and then they can rate how much they experience any of these things, right? So one of the things that you will notice is personal distress, it's all highly, highly negative emotional reactions, right? Highly charged, very negative. And over here, you have almost a very cozy, warm, fuzzy thing going on, right? I'm later gonna raise some questions about whether this is a good way of doing it. I mean, you have to understand one of the things that psychologists have to do, they have to instrumentalize their concepts, and they want to do it in such a way that they get different kind of reactions, right? So, presenting a more extreme version of each in opposite directions are going to be, make it more likely that you will get results, right? Another thing that I should just mention is that um, Batson typically induces empathy by asking people different types of questions, right? So the people who end up experiencing more distress are typically told, imagine if this were happening to you. How would you feel if you were in this situation, right? So the idea would be something like, you're very much identifying with the subject and then you're focusing on your own reaction and that causes much more distress than if you were focusing on the other person because the people who end up having a lot of empathic concern are being told to do something different. They're just saying, imagine how the other person feels. How are they feeling in their situation, right? So the different instructions are aimed to either achieve as much of an identification as they can, or a more distanced but caring approach, or a considerate or a, a thinking about the other person approach. Um, then we come to the slightly difficult question, which is the I idea of personal distress. So one of the things you will notice, if you know something of the literature, if you just looked at my slides, is that the distress that we're talking about, which is the distress you feel at the other person's distress, is called personal distress. And so you might wonder why, right? Because a typical empathic reaction is going to be one in which you feel an emotion very similar to the other person, right? So why are we calling this personal distress as opposed to empathic distress? The reason seems to be because the people who experience more distress than empathic concern tend to leave without helping the other person in distress, right? So it's the behavioral response that gives rise to this idea that it is purely personal. However, in one important paper where Batson actually just talks about distress, he asks people that do feel distress, 
to describe whether their distress is for themselves or for the other person. And everybody reports that they're experiencing both distress for themselves and for the other person, right? So that makes the notion or the idea that this distress is purely personal a little problematic, I think. Um, and so um, another thing you might also um, notice that if you um, believe that there is such a thing as empathy, and if you think that empathy involves a um, response very similar to the person that you're empathizing with, and you've got this way of looking at things, empathy does not exist, right? You're either personally distressed or you're sympathetic. So there's no possibility of actually empathizing with a person in distress because you go straight here and that's personal. It's just about you. Um, so uh, one, one issue that you find in the empathy literature, I think, is that the, I mean, I'm working with some psychologists at the moment on a paper about how to define empathy, and most of those people seem to agree that actually there is such a thing as empathic distress. But then again, a lot of the evidence that there is is built on questionnaires that uses personal distress versus um, sympathy or empathic concern. So it's, it's, um, it's a little bit of a mess. Um, but... Um, the, the study that I talked about where we have this evidence that people who are distressed experience distress both for themselves and for somebody else also shows that pretty much everybody experiences a combination of empathic concern or what I call sympathy and distress, right? So you have both of those reactions. So there are various... Um, theories about how this work, works, right? So an early and influential hypothesis was by Nancy Eisenberg that suggested that when you're first exposed to a person in distress, you experience a lot of distress, empathic distress. And then that develops in one of two directions. Either it turns into personal distress, right? So you're distressed and then you're thinking, oh my God, I'm so upset. I got to go home and, I don't know, have a drink or something like that, right? And then the person is drowning in the pool or whatever it is. Um, or you go like, oh, I'm so distressed, but like, oh, wait, okay, it's all right. It's the other person or, or something like that. Let me see whether I can do something for them, right? That, that's the idea, right? So you have the initial empathic response and then... It develops, and then you get either personal distress or you get sympathy. The problem with that, um, well, actually, why you get it is also a result of temperament and emotion regulation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about emotion regulation later. So let me just briefly say emotion regulation is the idea that often when we experience emotions, we do something to regulate that emotion. We do something to change it. So if you experience a lot of distress, say you pass a colleague in the hallway, and, and as opposed to them saying, hey, how are you? They go, hello. And then they wander on, and you get upset, you feel hurt, and then you think, oh my god, I was just snobbed, they're angry with me. And then you, you're upset, and then you start thinking, well, you know what I mean? Maybe they are just in a hurry. You know what I mean? Maybe I'm making a lot. And then your emotion changes, and maybe it becomes milder, and so on, right? So. Emotion regulation is, has become an interesting new topic, and of course the idea is that an emotional episode takes place over a period of time where regulatory mechanisms can take place. And Eisenberg actually has pretty good evidence that children that have good emotion regulation experience more sympathy than people who do not, right? So it seems to be a pretty important part of uh, development. Um, as I said, Batson is actually clear in his studies, even though he, he sort of makes it sound like it's one or the other, but actually his study shows that if you experience as much or more sympathy compared to 
distress, then you're more likely to help the other person, right? It's not just that you're only experiencing sympathy or empathic concern. And lastly, the Carrera and uh, Grunberg and Lopez Perez uh, actually show that people are reporting, as it were, a cascade, right? Where there's distress, there's sympathy, there's distress, there's sympathy, there's distress, sympathy. And then at the very end of the episode, and of course, you, if you want to know what the end of the episode is, I can't tell you, but <laughs> I mean, maybe that's the end of the experiment, right? But if towards the end there, you experience more sympathy, then you get the pro-social or the helping action that Batson talked about. But you can experience a heck of a lot of distress, and you can experience more distress overall than sympathy. What matters is at the end, you experience a little bit more sympathy or as much sympathy as distress, right? That suggests, again, that the emotions are co-occurring and there's a lot of interaction between the two along the way. So the intermediate conclusion is going to be something like empathy and distress, empathic distress and sympathy, um, which are my words for personal distress and empathic concern, um, are typically both experienced during an empathic episode. Um, and you can have you know, one being experienced more strongly at one point, the other less strongly, but they both seem to be present, even at the end. Emotion regulation seems to be particularly important here, um, but one thing that I want to note, and I haven't talked about that, um, is that there is actually some evidence, right? So, so a lot of this uh, Batson literature would seem to suggest that really, if you're exposed to another person in distress, you should really just try to get rid of your own distress ASAP, right? Because then you're more likely to help the other person, etc. And in fact, on a number of whatever talks that I've been at, there's, there've been some lively chats where apparently there is this, Buddhist, I forget his name, he's got a French name, who's like, oh, empathy is terrible, you should just feel sympathy. And everybody's got, well, he's a Buddhist, so therefore he must be right kind of thing, and isn't it all wonderful? Actually, there is evidence that people who are really good at regulating their emotions and regulating their emotions when they're exposed to other people in distress, they just regulate the distress away and then they don't help the person in need. So it seems like, you know, you can have too much distress and you can have too little distress. What you want is you want to have something in the mean. If you get rid of the distress, then it's also like, well, well, okay, whatever, you know. Um, so, you know, this sharp division between the positive and the uh, negative affect Namely, the positive affect being the sympathy, the prosocial motivation, etc., and this horrible distress that we just need to get rid of by separating ourselves from the other doesn't seem to actually align very well with what we are learning. All right, so let's move on to guilt and shame, unless there are questions. Are there actually, I should probably stop. Are there questions to this episode? Episode, yeah, well. This, this part of the talk. My problem is I know a ton about empathy and sympathy, so sometimes I just talk and then I'm assuming that you know everything else, I guess, right? So please ask questions. Why did you talk very, very loudly? So, if I speak very loud? Okay. So, silly question. <laughs> um, you just said that people who tend to uh, be able to control their emotions very well, what they do is they control their distress and then they don't help. And then immediately I thought about these people who are like, I don't know, doctors who are now in Gaza or something like that, people who spend huge amounts of time helping other people. And obviously, they have to be able to control their own distress, otherwise they will commit suicide or they will mm -hmm. stop doing it. 
Uh, is there any research about this kind of people? Because it seems like they can manage their emotions very well. Yeah, so there's, there's, there is um, evidence on, you know, there's, there's a lot of burnout amongst doctors and nurses, and that burnout seems to be related to unregulated empathy with patients, right? But there's also, um, there's, an, there's an interesting study that Jean Desetti made um, with, with uh, doctors and non-doctors, right? So what you do is that you expose people to a photograph of somebody getting a painful injection, right? And then you, um, then what you do, you do is an EEG and you see how, as it were, the, um, the signal travels in the brain, right? It turns out that um, both doctors and ordinary people, they have an initial or it's an orienting response, right? So you see, so the first activation is the visual area, right? And then you start focusing in and, you know, beginning. And then what happens in the doctors is there is an immediate dampening of the response, right? So there's orientation, but then dampening of the response, and then they're not as upset by it. Whereas in ordinary people, you have that. You have a similar response in psychopaths. So when psychopaths are exposed to people who are in distress, you have the orientation, and then a regulation of the response. So that's also an interesting. Eras. <laughs> yeah, a very simple question, general question. It seems to me but what you're saying about distress from one side and from the other, etc., you got some neurological uh, studies which go on your direction. For, it, for instance, also studies about the mirror of the neuron. Oh, right, yeah. And it seems to support your case. How do we have studies now, in really long ago, by Blair, not only Blair, but probably a psychopath? But by uh, psychologists in England claiming that if people uh, some form of psych psychopathy, it is right there, etc. James Blair, right? Yeah. yeah. You teach them or you help them, people like prisoners, etc., etc., to be empathic, they tend to improve. In there, and it seems that all these kind of studies, if I'm, if I'm right, if I understand you right, they go in your direction. They support your, uh, your viewpoint. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know whether James Blair. Ha I mean, it's, with, with psychopath and training and empathy training is very complicated, but, but yeah, I'll, I'll look into some of that, that stuff. The Parma people, the one who came out of Calese, yeah, yeah. came out with a story of mirror neuron, yeah. etc. Yeah. They seem to support your viewpoint from a neurological uh, perspective. That there is co experienced emotions. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Cool. If I see you, well, the studies, as far as I know about mirror neuron, is just if you see someone uh, hurting himself, your neuron, a sort of mirror, is a neuron of the angel, and you react in feeling distress, and so on and so forth. So forth. Yeah. Um, I know, as far as I know, it's only about these kind of cases, where it is like macaque, etc., and so on and so forth. Yeah. I don't know whether this or psychological or neurological studies, also when we share positive, we see someone happy, uh, someone happy, I feel happy as well. You say no, no. Um, well, you have studies with infants or very young children that show that children prefer to interact with a person that they see helping someone as opposed to hindering someone. Whether that's associated with positive affect, I don't know. Um, what you do find is you do find at least contagion in a lot of studies, right? So the problem is that if you, um, the brain studies that we have at the moment are not 
is do not distinguish between a contagious response and an empathic response, right? So if your distinction is contagion is you're just experiencing the emotion, but you're not necessarily thinking I'm experiencing this because you are experiencing that, right? So it lacks, it may lack the self-other distinction. Most of the studies that we have that say, oh, empathic pain or empathic this, that, and the other are actually studies that might equally be just vicarious pain. Um, my friend Tony Jack, who works in neuroscience, says that he doesn't think the mirror neurons has anything to do with empathy as he conceives of it, but he also tends to think of empathy more as a kind of reasoning about other people, so involving theory of mind and so on. So, it, I mean, it's pretty, it gets pretty complicated <laughs> pretty quickly. Thank you. Yeah, well, I remember, just whether I'm understanding well or not, um, uh, it seems, the way you, you, you present things at the beginning, uh, you, it seems that you accept initially that there are, in this case, is two kinds of, two different emotions that co-occur, right? Yeah. And they are usually distinguished by the different reactions uh, uh, from, from yeah, I'm from the, uh, facing the same situation. Now, then you suggested that, uh, I believe that, well, it could be explained in some other way, saying, well, instead of two reactions, or two emotions, we have one single bigger, uh, bigger, you know, emotion that with the effect of the uh, regulation control uh, would have different reactions. No, but, but, so there seems to be some difficulty in, in Agreeing on some criteria of individuation of of emotions versus emotion plus regulation and things like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right? So yeah, so I mean, you're asking your question too early, <laughs> just because I'm I'm gonna get to start thinking about thinking about that, and then if you want to hopefully think along with me on that issue because it, it gets pretty slippery. But but you're right. You know, now you start thinking, oh. Is it just one emotion? Is it really two? Like, who gets to decide? And then when you see how the psychologists sometimes define the emotion, you start getting a little suspicious, particularly here when it comes to guilt and shame. So um, the reason I call it the bad and the ugly, it comes from June Tangney. So June Tangney is like the big emotion researcher when it comes to guilt and shame. And her view is that guilt is kind of bad, but shame is really ugly. And she's also the, um, she has um, designed a measure of shame and guilt called, uh, and some other emotions too, it's called Tosca, which is the most widely used measure of shame and guilt in the literature. So, um, Here's Brene Brown on shame. This is a very common view about shame, and she takes it very much from Tangney's work, right? What is shame? Well, it's an intensely painful feeling of being flawed and therefore unworthy of acceptance and belonging, right? Notice the intensely. Um, shame often causes feelings of fear, blame, and disconnection. It's closely associated with gender roles, so, so the kinds of things you will be shamed, ashamed of as a woman are going to be different than the kinds of things you're ashamed of as a man, right? So for instance, as a man, you might be ashamed of not being able to uh, financially take care of your family, whereas a woman, you might be ashamed of, I don't know, not being as sexually attractive as you are, as you used to be, or something like that, right? Shame, the opposite of shame, she says, is empathy. Um, and to have a better life and better connections with other people, one needs to develop shame resilience, right? So here you get a very, very typical picture of shame in the psychological literature. Shame is essentially a horrible emotion that we should all, post-haste, get rid of if we possibly can. So um, you might have more positive experiences with shame. Because, because there is actually an interesting literature that shows that Mediterranean cultures have a more positive attitude towards shame than do Northern European and American cultures. So, for instance, there's some interesting work suggesting that um, Spanish people, I don't know about Basque people, but there are at least some Spanish people here, I'm assuming, um, they think that if you feel shame, that might actually... <laughs> 
reaffirm your connection with other people rather than just being this horrible thing where you got to go and hide under the carpet at home or something like that. So if you look at June Tangney's Anne Tosca, here is how she defines guilt and shame, right? Shame concerns the whole self, right? So when you're ashamed of something, you're ashamed of being the person who this, that, and the other, right? So if you're ashamed of... Um, I don't know, having a big nose, then you really feel that the nose defines you as a person or something like that, or you might be ashamed of um, not performing as well as you might have thought you would or something like that, right? And then you're really, it's, I, it's, it's something that really defines you as a person. It feels really deeply humiliating. So the self is painfully scrutinized and negatively evaluated. It's associated with a sense of shrinking and being small, powerlessness and worthlessness. It involves a desire to hide or escape, and it causes seething hostility, aggression, reduced empathy, and externalization of blame. So externalization of blame is, well, it's not my blog, it was those people who made me, whatever. So you can see this is all pretty bad, right? We have this, uh, this view of shame. It's like, well, well, you know, I mean, let's see if we can get rid of it as soon as possible, right? So then you look at guilt. Um, and you might want to think about Catholic guilt, some of you maybe, which may not look as cozy as this picture shows, right? It concerns something that you did. So the big distinction between shame and guilt is supposed to be where shame really directs you at yourself as a whole person. Guilt just concerns the action that you performed. So you're focusing on the action. And then the action is evaluated as harming or hurting something or someone, right? So the reason the action is problematic is because you're harming or hurting something out there. So instead of the focus being on you, it's on the consequences of the action. Guilt is uncomfortable, but it's not debilitating. It's associated with empathy and taking responsibility for action. So if you feel guilty, you're much more likely to say, oh, well, you know, I'm really sorry, I did X and Y. Um, it's less associated with anger, and it's oriented towards reparative behavior. This is a big thing for Tangney, right? So she says, look, if you're ashamed, you crawl away, <laughs> right? And you don't even try to repair actions, but if you feel uh, guilt, you do something to reestablish the positive relation with the person, if possible. So, um, one of the things that you should note um, let's see. Um, I just want to stop there and say, I've read a lot of this literature, and of course, all the literature supports the idea that shame is bad and guilt is good, right? And then you think, well, how could it not? If shame is measured in this way, and guilt is measured in that way, right? It's very hard to see how you would get something very positive out of something measured in this way. So one of the things you have to remember again, Tosca does not ask the people to say, are you feeling guilty or are you feeling ashamed? It describes a situation and then says, would you react like this one, right? There will be sentences like, I would feel small like a rat. Anyone want to guess whether that's guilt or shame? <laughs> right? So you can see that there's potentially an issue here. Um, Tosca is also dispositional, right? Um, insofar as it just describes your tendency to act in certain ways. And there's actually some situational data, right, on, sh on guilt in the situation that suggests that shame motivates uh, more approach than actually retreat, um, using a different measure than Tosca. Um, and one of the things that you will notice is that Tosca measures reasonable and functional amounts of guilt and excessive and dysfunctional amounts of guilt. You might think back at the personal distress and empathic concern. Right there, we also had this sort of seemingly quite exaggerated opposition of these emotional uh, reactions. Um, 
So here are some Tosca examples. A measure of guilt is, I should have studied harder. Um, sorry. Um, these are kinds of, you know, they're presented, I haven't described the situation, right? But there, there's some situation will be described, and here are the options, right? So you will say, okay, I should have studied harder. I would apologize and talk about that person's good points. You'd feel bad. You hadn't been more alert driving down the road. Notice these are all reactions that are relatively mild, right? Whereas you, you go to shame, right? You would feel small, like a rat, right? You would think, I'm, an ir I'm irresponsible and incompetent, or you would feel as though you want to hide. Right. So again, this is just showing that you're setting up a situation where you're measuring, right, dysfunctional aspects of one, functional aspects of other. Then you're going out and making the experiments with this, and lo and behold, you confirm this structure, right? But it's not really a surprise. Why? So um, there's been a number of uh, people, psychologists, who have um, complained about this, right? So they say, guilt measures a tendency to reparation associated with guilt, and Tosca shame measures a tendency to global negative self-evaluation, right? So this is a way of trying to describe Tosca without using the words guilt or shame, but you can see that there is quite, um, quite a difference in what they are uh, measuring. Um, if you use alternative measures of reparative behavior and negative self-esteem, um, you get the same results as Tosca, which suggests that what Tosca is not measuring is the distinction between shame and guilt, but the distinction between reparative behavior and negative self-esteem. Um, so... Um, the problem with um, this particular Tosca measure is that when Tang Ni started out doing her research, she just asked people to talk about typical examples of guilt and shame. And it turns out that these are things that shame and guilt all have in common. The degree to which the emotions are anticipated, how long they last, the degree to which they involve feeling disgusted with self, or angry with oneself or others, the degree to which a moral standard was violated, the seriousness of the act, felt responsibility and control, self or other blame, whether the focus was on the self or the other, feeling exposed, and the desire to make amends. So when she measured, not using the Tosca measure, right, here is all the similarities. That's a lot of similarities right there. What are the differences then? Well, it seems like, you know, guilt might be less sudden and more and intense versus shame that is more sudden and more intense. Guilt feels slightly better than, uh, sorry, guilt feels, okay, feels slightly better. This should be shame, sorry. Um, guilt feels slightly better than shame. Shame feels slightly worse than guilt. Fewer bodily changes in guilt, more bodily changes in guilt. So you can see these are all very comparative structures, right? Where you have sort of a milder reaction on the one hand and a stronger uh, reaction on the other. Some differences that are more sort of significant are maybe a greater feeling that others are angry, greater desire to hide the self and wrong for others, right? But otherwise, you seem to have a lot of similarities. So, intermediate conclusion, guilt and shame co-occur more often than not. Guilt focuses on the action and the consequences of that action for others, whereas shame focuses on the self as the origin point of the offending action and the consequences, consequences for who that person is. Both shame and guilt are then appropriate em emotions under many of the same circumstances. And the sharp division into negatively and more positively valence effectivity is problematic, right? It seems to be a matter of slight degree, but not this massive opposition that we see in the Tosca measure. Um, and um, very interestingly, just one, one last argument against the Tosca measure is that um, 
criminals who report experience quite a lot of shame are more likely to rehabilitate than people who are reporting more guilt than shame. So, super complicated. Um, and no worries, I'm gonna speed. <laughs> gonna speed. Well, I took some questions earlier, right? So, are there any questions at this point about shame and guilt? Just a moment. Yeah. Um, there is a sense of shame, I think maybe because I'm thinking as for Spanish, which is not a concept so close to guilt, but something like, you know, I dream that I'm naked in the streets, so I'm ashamed. I mean, I feel shame. It's the kind of stuff that gets my face yeah. red. Yeah, yeah. So I think that I don't have any, I would react, I mean, I'd like to, be, to hide and all that. Yeah. But there's nothing I should repair. In fact, it's something I kind of help filming. But, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I feel like stupid maybe, but you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, uh, yeah. You are not taking that into the. I, well, I'm, I, I think that, I mean, I think it's a, I mean, it's a good point. I mean, shame, there are situations where it seems like shame is much more likely. Nakedness is a classical example. Or being seen to do something which is perfectly okay in private, right? So a recurrent nightmare that I had as a kid was that I would be at school, I would be sitting on the toilet, with my pants down here, and then all of a sudden I realized that there's glass all the way around and every, all my <laughs> students and one another walking past, and I'm like, oh shit, what do I do, right? And feeling, of course, ashamed, right? Um, and, and those are sort of the, the typical reaction. But just to sort of get the sense of there are many, many situations where you're actually doing something that you might feel either guilt or shame for, and there it gets much more complicated, right? So I don't want to make the point that you never experience just empathy and not sympathy, that you never experience just shame or guilt, but that you have so many situations where they co-occur, and that raises an interesting question. Does that help? Thanks. Okay, good. So grief and relief, this is much shorter um, as a section because it turns out that there's very, there's very little literature on it, uh, scientific literature. So I, um, when I uh, wrote this section, I actually surfed the internet and what you get, all the big sites about grief and death and medical like science, et cetera, et cetera, they will all talk about this. If you look at the literature and you put in grief and relief, there's like one article about it, and then the rest is just about relieving grief, but not relief at the same time, except for some doctoral thesis. It seems like it might be coming up as a research, but it's interesting that it's so prevalent in all the professionals who are talking about grief, and there's so little work done it in psychology. But anyway, characteristics of grief is that you feel sadness or depression, numbness, denial, or disbelief, confusion, anxiety and panic, anger or resentment, feeling overwhelmed, relief, calm, or exhausted. So these are all things that may or may not occur, right? So the idea, of course, is it's not everybody who experiences all of these emotions, but these are very, very common emotions when people are grieving the death of someone. Um, and what I want to focus on is these two, sadness or depression and relief, because they seem to be the most opposite, right? And so it's curious that they should be part of the same episode. So here's an example. It's um, a woman who says, it was so hard to be with my husband at the end. It was a relief when he finally died. The 80-year-old wife confesses, a month after her spouse finally succumbed to a slowly spreading lung cancer. But then she adds with a stricken look, I feel terrible about feeling relieved. It's as if I wanted him to die. I didn't. She pauses again before saying quietly, not really. Right? And I think this is very characteristic. Um, the, the sense of relief is much more common in people that spend a lot of time taking care of a person who's slowly dying, or they're expecting them to die. Um, or perhaps are so attached to them that they're terrified of them dying, right? Um, so actually a lot of the grief websites will spend a lot of time telling people why it's okay to feel relief. 
Because that's going to be, as you can imagine, that's the hardest thing. It's like, oh, my husband died. I'm so relieved, right? You, that everybody would just like, oh, you know. Um, but it's very, very common. Um, as I said, there's not a lot of scientific literature on it, but there's tons of verbal reports all over the place of this. Um, now, although grief reaction is often described as one, you've heard the, about the five stages of grief, right? It's something like shock, disbelief, um, what is it? Anyway, then there's acceptance at the very end, and so on, right? Then there's probably anger as well somewhere in there. But um, so you can imagine, okay, maybe it's just like one, you have one emotion, then you have the other, and it's sort of a progression. That turns out not to be true. Even people who are five steppers will say you can march back and forth between the five steps for, for a long time. So again, it seems like these are different kinds of emotional reactions you have within a, within a similar or almost the same uh, episode. The, the bigger difference here is that it seems like the relief and the sadness involve contrary evaluations, whereas distress, sympathy, and guilt, shame involve very similar ones, right? They're, they're a little different, but not seemingly as different as um, sadness and relief. So what do we make of concurrent emotions? So uh, one possibility is the no big deal response, right? <laughs> Which is just to say, hey, I mean, you're describing all these cases, there's one emotion, then there's another, then there's another, then there's another. Well, that's just what we always said, right? There's one emotion at a time, there's one, then there's the other, etc. And And that's just, that's just uh, what there is. They're not experienced at the very same time, so there's no problem. So um, in response to that, I would say that the kinds of reports that we have in distress and sympathy is re people report experiencing both at the same time they might report one being stronger than the other, but they do typically you know, uh, report experiencing both. Similar about shame and guilt, there's often, but not always, right? People res responding that they feel both. Um, and often they're sometimes confused about whether they're experiencing one or the other. Um, and I think in general, one of the things we don't talk very much about in the, in the literature is ambivalence, right? Have you ever felt ambivalent about anything? Right? I mean, it's a very, very common emotional reaction, but there's very little work done about it when, when you're thinking about big theories of how emotions work, right? It's, it's, it's sort of like, I think the idea is let's figure out how each of these emotions work, each on their own, and then we can add up, right? And I think what I'm trying to do is to complicate that picture and say maybe that's not quite the right way to go. I want to suggest that concurrent emotions are more the norm than the exception. I think that a lot of the time, so much of the time that we can say it's normal, people experience more than one emotion pretty much at the same time. Even though they might say, I might be experiencing a little bit more of one than the other, they're still, they're there at the same time. Um, and I think in many ways, we shouldn't be surprised about that. Why not? Well, a very classical view of emotions is that emotions are evaluations about how the world affects our well-being. Um, the world is a large place. <laughs> Right? And any one situation might have a lot of different aspects of features to it. Right? So, for instance, in distress and sympathy, you might think they're both appropriated, uh, appropriate. Right? Distress is associated with um, identification with the suffering, which is natural or normal under the circumstances. And sympathy is more connected to a sort of sense of humanity or care for other people, which is also appropriate under the circumstances, right? So it depends a little bit on what you're focusing on or what aspect of the situation is most figural, what kind of emotional reaction is going to be the strongest. In guilt and shame, often 
We experience guilt and shame at the same time for things that we do or failures to do something, right? That seems appropriate too, insofar as if shame is really concerned about you, right, I have failed to perform properly, or I'm the one who did this, etc., right? Then it's natural that you should feel more, you should feel shame, but then you also perform an action that might have hurt other people, and then you can focus the attention there and think, whoa, what about this other person, right? And then guilt is going to become more figural. Similarly, sadness and depression is focused on the loss of the beloved, and relief is focused on the stress of caregiving, vicarious distress, and anticipating further decline, right? So it's extremely stressful to be with a loved one who's going to die or who's suffering, who has dementia, who no longer recognizes you and some, or something like that, right? And people, of course, wouldn't say they don't want to take care of their loved ones, but their loved ones dying releases them, right? They're no longer expecting the stress and, and all the time being taken up and so forth and so on, right? So... There's really, I think, no reason why we shouldn't think that many emotions co-occur, because, as you say, the world is complex, right? I think a lot of, a lot of ideas of emotions um, is like, you know what I mean? You, you meet a bear on a path, and it jumps out, and you're like, oh, oh my God, right? And then it does, that emotion is the figural emotion, and there's nothing else going on, right? And that may be true of fear, but to use that idea for every emotion might be. A problem. So um, you might respond and say, well, no, you know, this is the no big deal uh, part two. Idealization is not a problem, right? How does science work? Well, look, the world is very complicated. What do scientists do? Well, they tend to isolate particles and see how particles work, right? And particle generators and so forth and so on, right? Then they try to split the atom. These are all completely artificial environments in which you're isolating aspects of the reality that is not usually isolated in order to understand them better with the idea that if we understand these better, then we can scale up and understand the whole system better. So isn't that just what we're doing with emotions? Well, um, one thing I would say is, well, how can we be sure that we're carving emotions correctly when we separate certain features of the lived experience from others? Right, so there I'm particularly thinking about a lot of the psychological meshes, right, which, I've, which I'm hoping that I have now convinced you of are at least potentially problematic. Um, moreover, we know from the emotion regulation literature that what happens during an emotional episode has a lot of effect on how the emotion unfolds over time. Right, so the kinds of thoughts that you have, you might say you might reevaluate the situation, then the emotion might be dampened, or you might experience a different emotion. Um, so there's really no reason to think that if you're experiencing another emotion at the same time, that that would itself affect the first emotion, right? So you have an overall experience that isn't just the same experience as two separate emotions, like we understand them each on their own, and then boom, you know, we have understood what it is to experience two emotions at the same time. Now, you might think, okay, well, you know, maybe what's going on is that you actually have a tension of different emotions, like in a classical ambivalence case, right? Am I happy about this or am I sad about it? Well, I don't really know. You can go back and forth and you're like, well, wait, I'm happy. You know what I mean? And then the problem goes away. But as you can tell, like in most of the examples that I've given you, there's more reason to think that these types of emotional responses continue alongside one another. In some scenarios, one might end up being a little stronger than the other, but maybe not. So then you might say, okay, all right, I've accepted everything you said, so maybe what we should just say now is there is, just, there is one emotion and not two in these cases, right? Um, so, for instance, we name one shame because its object is the agent and the other guilt because the object is the action and its consequences. So this is just all, this is going to be our linguistic conventions, right? Our way of carving up space that is socially determined, largely, right? So you might have some kind of old evolutionary old response, but then we carve it up in various ways, right? Um, 
But um, then you're left with the problem. It's like, well, maybe in guilt and shame you can kind of do that, although you do have the problem, as Kippa points out. What about nakedness and shame? Right? That guilt doesn't tend to play a big role there, right? And there may be more um, shameless guilt episodes too, even though a large part of it is all, as it were, blended together. Then, of course, you get into this question. You think, well, we can't solve this problem until we've decided what an emotion is, <laughs> right? So then you get back to the very point, right? And here are typical uh, structures of what you say an emotion is, right? An emotion is something that has prototypical eliciting conditions. Fear, you know, they're like a bear or something like that. Typical motivation action pattern, which is, you know, um, uh, escape, fight, or uh, what is it? Fight, flee, or freeze, the typical three Fs. Um, there are expressive symptoms, right? So that would be... Did I do it, do it correctly? <laughs> That's a fear face, right? <gasps> There's a, the whole bodily thing. Um, there are bodily changes, right? So you know when you feel afraid, it's like your heart starts to pound, right? And you get all really tense, and you're like, ah. Um, and then there's the evaluation, the significance of the event. Danger, there's something dangerous, something dodgy. And then there's typical patterns of attention. So you notice that if you're walking home late at night, you're really sensitive to little sounds, right? <gasps> You know, there's, was that something in the leaves or rustling, right, to get very nervous? Whereas, you know what I mean? If you're um, jealous, you don't tend to focus a lot on leaves rustling. It's just not, not relevant. So some people there, of course, as you might have suspected, there's a huge literature here on basic versus non-basic emotions, right? And you might think, oh, really, the problem is that a lot of the emotions that you're talking about are not basic emotions, but really just maybe shame and sadness are. Um, but you might think, well, okay, <laughs> but that, does that really make the difference that we're, that we're looking for? So, um, let's see. Okay, I want to go here because I know that I'm taking too long. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> here is sort of my suggestion, and that's where I need your help to, to see whether you think this is actually a satisfying end to a hopefully riveting talk. Um, and that is, right, some people say an emotion has to be brief. Um, it, you actually find it in the literature. If it's a longer emotion, then people want to talk about moods and so forth and so on, right? Um, some, some emotions might be like that, but I don't think it's, it's a good idea to think that all of them are, right? So um, something like surprise or startle seems to be typically short, right? So a startle... <gasps> You're startled, then you see what's going on, and then startle might develop into fear or something like that, but that's a very short um, emotion. But if you think about anger, jealousy, sadness, joy, anxiety, and lust, they might last for a, quite a while. I'm just reading a book now where the uh, main character claims that my anger carried me into the next day. So, I don't know, 10 hours or something like that. That's not short by any stretch, right? Um, moreover, um, a characteristic about psychopaths is supposed to be that they have shallow emotions, meaning that they're explosive, they're very short-lived, lived, and they don't have the usual sort of consequences afterwards. So, uh, clearly we don't, we don't want to want that in our definition or our understanding of emotions. So the instances of emotions we've all considered are potentially long, longer left, and what characterizes them is that the person might experience, for instance, one th one, the guilt more strongly, and then shame, or then shame more strongly, and guilt. So uh, um, if we then move on to grief, and we think about grief in this instance, you will notice that Grief is a, it's a very human emotion, and actually you see it in non-human animals. Elephants are famous, right, for returning to places where some of their, as it were, compatriots died, right, and touching the bones with their, with their toss, with their, what do you call it? Trunk, trunk, thank you. Um, 
Um, but it's not supposed to be a basic emotion, right? It's not a basic emotion. Why not? Well, you might think, okay, maybe the suspicion is, if you look at what we talked about grief before, it's a composite of all of these different reactions, right? So maybe it, it's, if we take the idea that grief might be understood as a sort of umbrella emotion with lots of different aspects of emotional reactions, as it were, under it, as typical parts of it, then using that might actually resolve some issues if we think about the other emotion pairs that I've talked about. In particular, empathy, right? People are always complaining. Well, you talk, you call empathy this, I call empathy that, it's a big mess, blah, 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 blah. But what if a typical empathic episode is one that might involve all of these different things? It might involve some contagion, it might involve some sympathy, it might involve some distress if the person is in distress and so on, right? Um, it might even involve something like outrage and anger, right? Because if you see somebody who is in a really distressed position, Right? Then you might get angry. You'll get angry with the system or you get angry with the person that caused the person to be in that situation in the first place. Right? So a lot of emotions seem to be possible under this sort of general, um, in this kind of general situation of being exposed to somebody in need. Similarly, you might regard reactions to some wrongdoing, for instance, as involving a suite of reactions. Guilt, shame, regret, remorse, depending on how which aspect of that event or that action you're looking at? Are you looking at who performed it? Are you looking at the consequences for others? Are you looking at the consequences for how you're going forward as a person and so forth and so on, right? Um, so I want to suggest that concurrent emotions suggest that many of our emotional reactions are better understood in terms of emotional syndromes than in terms of atomic emotional reaction. Um, and that might explain, I, I don't, I'm going to leave this um, until I'm able to express it a little better. But the, the essential idea is that empathic responses are pretty, pretty complex. Um, and uh, for instance, these lovely people who tend to experience more sympathy than distress will actually not help people if, it just, if it's too onerous. <laughs> right. Um, and um, in other cases, the people who are experiencing a lot of distress might actually help people if it's difficult to leave the situation. So I'm thinking that in some of these cases, what's happening is that the fact that there's a concurrent emotional reaction actually changes the overall motivation depending on the type of situation that we're looking at. Um, okay, so this is, that's the end. Errors. Oh, sorry. Thanks a lot, I, I truly enjoy your talk, and I am um, very convinced. I have a very simple, basic question. Yeah. As usual, very simple. A tricky question. The very simple question that the speaker mysteriously is unable to answer. <laughs> no, the fact is, um, it's a general question. Yeah. How would the story, it seems to be convincing to me, how does it relate to the debate in philosophy of mind about modularity? Would you accept this kind of general modularity Sperber, like Sperber, for instance, when you got module what communicate one again with the other, or would you be committed with a kind of more fodder like picture when you got few modules which are insulated and after we communicate to a general uh, umbrella module, etc. Just a, a question of curiosity on how your story on uh, emotion, which seems very convinced to me, could be explained in philosophy of mind, for instance, in yeah. terms of modularity. Because it I seems mean, that you are somewhat... I, d I tend not to be a modul modularist. So, I mean, I just, I don't, I don't, certainly I don't think 
that there are modules in the way that modules were presented early on, like you know, with Fodor and, and probably Sperber as well and so on, right? There are people who talk about, and there's been some suggestions that emotions might be like modules as well. Um, I, I, think that that's, I think that that's wrong. But is it possible that one or two emotions are very modular? I think that that's possible, right? Fear? Startle, things like that, right? Where where the the survival value is extremely, I mean, it's survival value of those reactions is extremely high, right? So it may be that we're just wired in such a way that these are just prepotent responses and they and they flow a certain way, right? But if we're talking about emotions generally, right, there's a heck of a lot of different emotions. And then to think about emotions generally as a class, right, I mean, I think this is, this is part of the problem, a part of the debate between people who have a very cognitivist theory of emotion, right, where they're saying really what characterizes an emotion is really more the evaluation of the environment and not so much the bodily changes versus Jamesian views where you're really focusing on the bodily changes as being paramount and central to an emotion, I think that is that they're all looking at different cases, right? So Jennifer Robinson, for instance, who uh, argues for a Jamesian view, she focuses on startle. James, James's great article is fear, right? So you take startle and fear, and then it really seems like, of course, the body is super involved in these kinds of cases, right? But then maybe when you look at other instances like envy, or schadenfreude or something like that. You know what I mean? It, things become much more complex, right? So I think that what we want is we want a theory of emotion that's able to embrace these different aspects. And then it might be that a theory of emotion might be more disjunctive than we would like, right? And there I think, I think we have certain Intuitions as philosophers, we like things to be elegant. We like if there's one phenomena, we call it emotion, then the explication should look similar. But then I think what we're doing is we're just imposing our own limited understanding onto the world and trying to force it into a Procrustean bed. So I want to leave open that there may be more modular reactions. It's possible. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, but I don't think as a whole that characterizes the emotions. question, uh, some emotion like guiltiness, etc. How are where or how can they be culturally related? For instance, if one raised in uh, the strong Catholic, as I've been, uh, yep. you feel uh, guilty and so on and so forth, but someone who's not related or raised in this kind of, so do you think what cultural differences may cause a, a difference in emotion. Yeah, emotions. I do. I do. I mean, there's, there's this famous distinction between guilt cultures and shame cultures. So supposedly Mediterranean cultures are more like shame cultures, and then Northern European and Americans are more like guilt cultures, and then, of course, shame cultures would also be East Asian cultures as well. Austral, Australia going in with the Western, right? What, what's the idea there? Well, the idea is that guilt is the most prominent emotion that you feel when you think something wrong has occurred. Um, and that is associated with a whole lot of different, you know what I mean, repairing actions, looking for the, the transgressor, you know what I mean, punishing the transgressor, if you're the transgressor, accepting some kind of punishment, but also trying to, you know, it's, it's a, if you're Nietzsche, right, you would say this is, this is uh, the Christian Christianity, right, taking over older moral systems, right, and imposing guilt as the central organizing emotion when it comes to what you ought to do. Um, where shame cultures are more classically ancient Greek cultures, right? So if you remember in the Iliad, Ajax kills himself because he's ashamed, right? So he, I don't know if you know this story about Ajax, right? So Ajax at the very end 
of the war, he fights with Odysseus over the armor of Achilles, who has been killed, right? And then, uh, if you know Odysseus, you know what's going to happen, right? So he, he tricks his way in a certain way. Right? He speaks very well, and he kind of manages to persuade people. Whereas Ajax is really the big warrior, and he's furious after this, and he wants to kill the Greek. And so Athena gives him hallucinations, and he goes out and kills a lot of sheep and the shepherd. But nobody seems to care about the shepherd in those days. It was, like, it was just like a... <laughs> Stand in sheep almost, right? So he kills all of those, and then he returns, and he's like, oh my God, he realizes what he's done, and he's so ashamed, and he's like, I wouldn't be able to look my father in the eye, and he commits suicide. That's a very, that's, that has a very different flavor to it than does guilt, the idea would be, right? And then if you look at all the typical shame cultures, right, your daughter is raped, and you kill your daughter, right, as in the Middle East, right? Because there's a, a the spot on your honor, and your honor demands the sacrifice of this, the person who's the victim, right? Because really, you're in an honor culture rather than a guilt culture. Now, I tend to think it gets much more complicated, and it's particular forms of honor cultures, and shame can play an important role without being tied to that. But, but that's, that's a story that you have. And you certainly do see these cultural differences, right? I mean, in, I know that in Canada, it's been a, it's been a problem, right, with some immigrants out of Muslim countries essentially, you know, killing their own daughters because they have, you know, yeah. Um, I have a quite general question out of curiosity. Yeah. Maybe a political question, I don't know. Uh, Come my attention that you didn't even mention uh, the phenomenal nature, or character, or feeling, or something of emotions. I mean, you had that slide, what oh, emotions are, or what is an emotion, something like that. You know, with many different features of emotions. And, you know, there was nothing phenomenal there, which is... Yeah, I, right. I found that, that a bit uh, curious, because it seems to me that something quite yeah. uh, characteristic of emotions is that they are felt. That yeah. you feel emotions yeah. and there is something which is li uh, that it is like uh, feeling shame or feeling, I don't know, uh, disgust or feeling yeah. joy or whatever. And then yeah. I wonder, maybe this may be related with the general issue that you want to discuss. Because if you focus on the phenomenal, different phenomenal character of different uh, emotions, then maybe that makes it more difficult to understand how one can feel two very different things at one mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. So, well, that's like the general question. Yeah. Why, why, why didn't you that, even mention that? Which seems like something that it's simply, quite close it, to it emotions. It was simply an omission. It's boring. It's a boring <laughs> answer. I was, you know, writing this slide a couple of hours ago, and when I thought about, uh, I was thinking about affect, and then I thought, oh, bodily changes. So I put in bodily changes, and then I forgot to put in the affect. Of course, bodily changes are typically associated sure. with affect, so it, it was just an omission. Okay. You're absolutely right. So. And and don't you think that that may be related with the general discussion? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I do. I do. So um, the um, I think one of the so I mean in guilt and shame, and in um, sympathy and in distress, unless you make the exaggerated distinction that we see in psychology, right? I think that they, they are much closer together, and so they don't seem to be as opposite as sadness and relief, right? Sadness and relief, that's really the, the puzzler, right? And that goes into what we often call, what we would talk about ambivalent emotion, right? Because when we feel ambivalent, it's usually, there's a positive evaluation and then a negative evaluation, right? And then you're like, oh, <laughs> what, what's going on in this kind of in this kind of instance. Um, and so I think the, the temptation would be to say, oh, well, we have different emotions once you have a different affective quality. But um, then it gets complicated again, right? Because I think some people want to, when they talk about negative and positive emotions, it's very interesting. Is it just how they feel? Or is it whether they have positive or negative effects. And it turns out that, that there isn't a straight correspondence. I mean, fear is a highly 
negative emotion with really positive, <laughs> you know, results, anxiety. And again, I'm just talking about a well-regulated fear, a well-regulated anxiety. These are what we would call negative emotion insofar as they're high negative affect, but otherwise you might think that they're quite positive otherwise for what they, you know, what, what comes out of them. But um, to return to your question, right, one reason, um, I guess, I mean, a potential extra slide would be, right, to say, look, here's, here's a reason why you might think um, that sadness and relief cannot be one emotion. Why? Because they feel so different, right? And that's when you come into thinking about, okay, maybe what we ought to think is that, um, I mean, okay, let me, let me be clear. My idea is not, I think, that we should throw out standard emotion theory with the bathwater, right? And then we should just have these emotional syndromes. Because, of course, I have these emotional syndromes, and how do I describe them? Well, I have these emotional episodes inside them that are the emotions that standard emotion theory talks about, right? But I think what you might think of it is an addition, a sort of broadening with consequences of how, I think, potential consequences of even how we think about the individual emotions. But obviously, I haven't worked that out in this talk. about the relation between emotions and time. Um, yeah. You mentioned that sometimes some people call them moods instead of, of um, talking about the, 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 the length, uh, yeah. temporal length of the, of the thing. So now I'm thinking about there can be other, other differences concerning. I mean, there seem to be some emotions that can only be about the future or here, more clearly, about the past. Regret, sadness maybe, uh, relief, grief, things that, yeah. uh, uh, guilt, things in the past. All the things Anticipa seem to be impossible. Anticipatory yeah. guilt is a big thing, but yeah. Okay, yeah. so then, then we, some of them seem to be, like you can have all the time, distress about the past, about the present, about the future, yeah. but maybe there are different kinds of uh, distresses and arising different feelings, and some others are about the future only, maybe hope or enthusiasm or I don't know. Uh, yeah. So so I, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> I, I mean I mean anything short that you can tell me. Yeah, there is a clear taxonomy, possible taxonomy, that classify these things according to whether they are specifically about the future and the future only, the past, past only, present only or that go across all things. Like, because in well, talking so about mental states, you can have that, right? Like, you, you distinguish between remember, only past, or planning, only for the future, right? And believing that can be about everything, so. Um, I mean, if we're, if we're just talking, so let's not talk about emotions in general, but about the emotion pairs that I've been talking about, right? Now, I think if you think about, um, uh, something like shame and guilt, I think they, they have a broad scope. You can be guilty about something that you did a while ago. You can do, feel guilty while you're doing something. You're passing the beggar. You're kind of thinking, I really should be giving them some money, but really, I, I'm in a hurry. I can't be, you know what I mean? I'm the, what is it, the Pharisee who's passing on the other side while the person is lying there, right? Um, or you might f think, okay, I, I would like to X, and then you think, boo, then you get this pang of guilt. I think it's the same thing with shame. Shame cuts across all these episodes, too. You know, might think, well, you know, I might do this, but then you're like, oh, well, I would be ashamed, right? And for a lot of people, I think they think that's the real value of shame and guilt. It's not so much that they're just backwards looking and we're just feeling bad for no reason. It's that when we're planning ahead, we have emotional reactions to our plans and then we might not perform the actions that we are performing. 
But I think, like, in, in my, in the, the sort of idea that I have about um, emotional syndromes is that I, at least potentially, I would have thought it would be fine to have two, um, uh, two typical emotional reactions within that syndrome, one which is forward direction and one which is backward directed, right? Because I think the, the thing that I like about the syndrome is that it gets into the corners of the situation that you're in, right? The idea that in a, in a way, cognitively speaking and physically speaking, you're very finely attuned to your environment so you can see, you know what I mean? There's the good side, there are the bad sides, there's, you know what I mean? There are these issues back and forth, right? Um, now, then of course, what we need to know more about is like, how do I define an emotional syndrome? And the answer is I'm not, because I don't believe in definitions, but I will give a characterization at, at, some, at some point. That's the idea anyway, yeah. Thank you very much for, for the talk. I think there was, there was a lot of things that it's going to be difficult to probably we can spend hours yeah. discussing in small details every yeah. each uh, of the motions. But with your last answer, I, I have come back to think that I may ask what I was going to ask from the, uh, earlier. It's going to the the point of your talk, or when you were asking us, well, I need some feedback to see how yeah. it works. And if you allow me, what I think that I haven't been able to, to concentrate enough because you have gone perhaps too fast for me in the last part about the episodes and the syndromes, yeah. where I think is the, the answer of what I am going to ask you now. Right. Is that if you're, the, the goal of the talk was about when emotions go together, we were saying, I think that from what I've understood, you are not trying to say, to tell us just that we have overlapping emotions. No. It's, it's not that uh, over the same object or with the same trigger, either, or that they are ambivalent or, or fuzzy emotions. This, I think this is not your point. I think that you are trying to make a more substantial point about, a point about having concurrent uh, emotions. But perhaps I've lost it. Eh? But I think in the end, with so many details, it wasn't so clear when those emotions were concurrent. I need that for that you need to show us that they are connected somehow, perhaps dispersed. Eh? So, to, you to mean, how, so you how, mean how they as related. opposed to, oh, I just, you know what I mean? I happen to experience one emotion and then something happens and then I'm experiencing that emotion and then. Hmm. Okay. Something, yep. something that makes more substantive that they are not just that they sometimes go together or I can have both of them. Because one option is that you are telling us that when the sample when we shift from one to another, no? but then you have introduced another very powerful but distrusting element, which is the regulation of emotions. If we have this idea of the regulation of emotions, it seems that you are kicking up the situation to another level. Where does this control come from? And everything becomes mm -hmm. even faster. Well, the issues about cultural influences and all that, which then, I mean, the regulation makes, may help to understand how we shift, but then if we have, have to go, just to say, a higher level, then the, the discussion may be in this higher level. And, well, yes, but I think, for, I forgot when you are trying to, to, to describe these emotional syndromes, that there is the, the point, but... I wanted just to transmit you that you have, you have given us a lot of information, but I'm not sure, because it's my fault, that we have been able to see which the idea of concurrent emotions is given, is given to how they are connected in a more special or particular way than just co-occurring or just uh, being overlapping or right, right, I don't right, know right, if right. I have expressed my yeah no no I, th I I I I think so right so I need to I mean to, so the way that I was looking at it was that um, concurrent emotions are the norm what I was trying to do was I was trying to say that these are 
would be appropriate emotional reactions to have in the same situation, right? So that would go back to some of the literature, right, that shows that, you know, emotions can be appropriate or not. And that would give us some reason. Well, we have both emotions occurring. They would both be appropriate under that circumstance. And so hopefully that would give people some reason to think that, you know, here we actually have a pair of emotions that are being experienced to the same general information if we sort of cut it wide, but not too wide, so it's everything, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but, but I think I should probably spend some more time making that clear, or, or does, that, does this not help you, or? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so what I'm, what I'm hearing you say is, okay, I spend a lot of time criticizing these single emotion thing, and then the, the talk ends with a sort of little bit of a fart, right? It's like, oh, we'll just put them all together under, under a thing, and then, oh, isn't that great? So, is, am I hearing you correct? I mean, you, you weren't as an uncharitable to me as I am to myself, as, of course, but, but no... No, 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 no. I mean, because I, I was going to ask you, is the end just disappointing, right? I don't want the end to be disappointing. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, like, like you're reading this book and it's like, it's great. And then there's the ending and you're like, that's it. You know what I mean? So, um, and, and if, it, if it's, well, it's because the end was is the is the least is the least elaborated, right? So you're you know you put your finger, right right on the pulse. So my question would be: Are your feelings that this notion of emotional syndrome is potentially interesting and could like oh yeah that would like to know more about that and we just need some more flesh on that, or is the idea of that just bringing in that? emotional syndrome, it's just sort of like a, a cop-out after like there's been a lot of exciting build-up and then, oh, that, that's all that we're concluding. Out to all of you. But remember, I know where you live. Okay. Which was which was it's 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 prom it's pro it's promising, but we need some more detail as opposed to yeah, I don't really see how this is gonna change anything. Yeah, I think there are several possible answers that we could. I mean, they're not decided yet, but thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but that uh, you know, uh, look for to me are very interesting, like. And go up and forth, back and forth, like from from an initial accepting of clear cut, more or less clear cut distinctions of emotions to uh, sometimes get those distinctions got blurred. Yeah, and it can be a combination of higher level of well, controlling of emotions plus, you know, an umbrella emotion. Or so you have several yeah. several different uh, ways to go with, I guess, different theoretical implications on the one hand and and also practical and uh, for empirical research, so. Yeah, so. I mean, I think actually when I thought about it, I thought there is, a, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting the three examples that I have, but I tend to think that the guilt, shame, and the sympathy, I mean, in a way, I think they might all have different solutions. So in a way, I can imagine the guilt, shame pair being one in which you just say, look, um, phenomenal, phenomenologically, they're very similar, right? But also the bodily changes may be so similar, right? There's this whole critique about the Jamesian view, right? That we just can't distinguish our bodily uh, reactions as neatly as we otherwise thought, right? And then there's, of course, all this um, research from emotion regulation that suggests that the way that you think about a situation really changes your reaction to it, right? And then once you put those together, there might be this sense of like, you know, we just, in, in a situation where there's both operating, it could be very difficult to 
separate one out from the other, and then what we're doing is we're really just separating it out in terms of what we're focusing on. Am I focusing on myself or am I focusing on the action? Because if people tell you that's the difference between shame and guilt, then it's very easy to determine, right? And then there's this question, is that really a whole, is that, are we pointing out a whole emotion? Or are we just really pointing to one not very well differentiated thing, right? Whereas if you move to sympathy and you move to personal distress, you might think a sympathy is a more dispositional, long-term attitude that you have to other people. And then the empathic distress is an emotion that surges up. And then you have the two. But that's very different from having two, seemingly two active emotions at the same time. And then you get to something like relief and sadness, right? Where you just like the first, the, the idea that you have with shame and guilt and being non-differentiated, -differ you can't, right? The, now it seems like, you know, you just have two emotions that are occurring that are really quite different because they involve probably different physical bodily changes. They involve different phenomenology. They involve different motivations and so forth and so on. But they're related insofar as they're experienced in direct response to the death of another. It's just that you're focusing on different aspects of what that uh, death means to you. So in a way, those are three different solutions. And I don't know whether that's a good, like, you know, I mean, I don't mind complicating things, but yeah, it's, it's not that neat. Oh, look, I've got a new schema and it all works just in this one way, you know. Right. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> so one, uh, uh, I think it's a way of agreeing with what you just said, because for me, the, I mean, like guilt and shame and the relation between, and the fact that they usually co 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 they go together. Yeah. And, um, and uh, grief and relief, it seems to me like, I mean, grief and relief, the cases you gave were always where, you know, uh, an 80 year old woman who has been taking care of her husband for a long time, you're basically tired, physically tired, and you're seeing somebody you love suffering, so you feel relief because, either because you can sleep or because the person you love is not suffering. So of course you feel grief and relief, but I don't really see the connection between grief and relief. I mean, you don't see, you, both feelings are generated by the same event, the person yeah. you love died. But you know, uh, you might also feel I don't know of some. You know, it, I don't. I don't see the the shame and guilt. Yes, because usually, you know, they are con even in the Bible. You know, you you're guilty. Now you're going to be shame of your body. You know, in the yeah, yeah, yeah. you ate the apple, whatever. You know, they are. You feel and the woman made you do it. The women, of course, the women did it, and now you're guilty, and now you're going to be sh ashamed of your own bodies and whatever. You know, and. So I see that there is a connection between being shame, but grief and relief, I was like, yeah, I mean, yes, of course, you, you can feel both of them at the same time, but you know, you can also feel love and sadness at the same time, or love and, and, and shame, or whatever, you know, and, and you know, it seems to me that they're just, they're responses to different things. You're feeling grief because the person you love is no longer with you, you feel relief, because he's not he or she's not suffering, or because you can sleep mm -hmm. or something like that. So, so maybe you know, I'm I'm trying to say that I, I think it's complicated. I mean, that <laughs> they, 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 they cannot be an account for all of them because they are so different. They and, are you so know, different. And also, some of them are like you know, you feel them, and sadness might become melancholy or might become a mood, but uh, but maybe guilt no don't you know? So uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, I think the shame and guilt is is much more, you know, you've got that closeness of uh, responses, but if you look at if you think about, you know what I mean? It, it, so here's again a way of carving, right? Because you could say the first the first thing I'm talking about is empathy versus sympathy. That's one way of talking about it, right? But notice what I'm saying really makes sense when it comes to empathic distress. So it's a particular type of empathic reactions. And then when I'm talking about the last case, it's a particular kind of grief reactions to a particular situation. It also concerns, um, you know what I mean, if you've got 
handicapped children or weak children or something like that, and they die, right? So there's, it's actually quite a lot of, and, and also if you're, if it's your partner that died and they were abusive or something like that, right? But it's a whole range, it's, it's an interestingly diverse situation, right? And the relief that you feel if you've been abused is probably quite different than the relief that you feel if you, you genuinely love the person, right? But you're also relieved because, right? Anyway, yeah. Uh, okay, sure. thank you. Uh, I have one question and another question. Uh, one is that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it, it seems to me that I, I I am not saying that you do that, but that in the experiments uh, they seem to assume that humans are good recognizing emotions. And I, I am not that sure about that. And second, uh, there seems to be quite related the, the thing of the bodily response or um, uh, body change or something to attach to an emotion, no? Like an emotion is related to, but- At least some emotions are, yeah. At least, at least some emotions, because I think that even one kind of emotion within one person can have different responses. So I can... Bodily responses. Bodily responses. So Could you give an when, example? I can cry of happiness or of sadness. Mm -hmm. I can... This, this kind of thing. So if we characterize the emotions by the... I, I don't... I don't... I get mess. Does it make... Sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I mean, crying is complicated, right? Because it depends. Are you are you thinking about that as an expression, or you're thinking about? But obviously, there had to be some bodily changes in order to get the expression going in the same place in the first place, right? But there, I mean, I think that you're quite right insofar as one of the things I haven't talked about is um, the kinds of situations where there is a similar sort of expression but you don't know what the person is feeling until you know more, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, for instance, if you see somebody crying, you think, oh my God, something terrible happened, and then you're zooming out and they're standing on top of the Olympic thingamajig with a medal, right? Then you know, okay, they're crying of happiness, right? Or, you know what I mean? Then, then there are different ways of zooming in and out, right? And, the, and that's part of actually, I mean, somebody like, uh, Feldman Barrett, right, she has this whole, she's on this whole crusade against the whole basic emotion theory, pretty much all emotion theory, right? She's like, emotions don't exist. They mm -hmm. simply don't exist. You have some bodily changes that are loosely connected with, you know, you've got valence, and then you've got um, strength, pretty much, right? And then the two interact, and then you pretty much get everything else, which are your ways of your body of anticipating events in the environment, so then there's all these interpretations, and, but that doesn't go along with any of the emotions that we usually really talk about, and they're not innately specified, mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. And some of the examples that she's using is exactly the kinds of things where people have problems. Right, so, what, so the, 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 the standard beginning of the whole basic emotion theory, right, came with Ekman, right, who wanted, initially wanted to show that people across different cultures have different emotions. How did he want to do it? Well, he took photographs of people with different facial expressions, then he told a story, and then he would show the facial, the, you know, a number of facial expressions, then he would ask, what would that person look like? And lo and behold, it turns out that there was a lot of agreement. Feldman Barrett claims that she hasn't been able to replicate that, um, I don't know whether I trust her exactly on that because I haven't seen all the evidence. Um, but one thing that is clear is that when it comes to facial recogni recognition of emotional faces, there are huge differences in how well you recognize different facial expressions, right? Um, and there's a lot of, there's a bunch of emotions that often are confused, like anger and surprise are often confused. So, you know what I mean? That, the sort of very neat 
also a sort of semi-Darwinian idea that we make the expressions that we do in order to signal to others what we're experiencing. So, you know what I mean, that will affect their action is problematized in that context. Now, I think that the problem with that idea is that in real life, we are usually not just exposed to somebody's this bit of their face, right? You know, they're, they're telling us things. We see that they're in a situation. We see their whole body. So, for instance, with shame, recognizing shame in people is quite difficult from the pure, if you just look at the face. But if you look at the whole body, then people's accuracy goes way up because shame tends to be associated with being slumped, physically slumped. Um, so anyway, sorry, I'm, I go on and on. I love talking about emotions, but oh, but it, but it, I mean, it gets very complicated, right? And it just shows how. I mean, it's difficult to recognize emotions in others, right? And then you've got the whole question about alexithymia, right? The inability to recognize your own emotions, and then there's also the. I mean, then then it becomes an interesting question. What kind of, are people having problems with recognizing some of the affective quality or what they feel like doing, or is it just the label that they have problems with? And I actually don't really know, right? Because I think it could be both. And then that would lead to quite different consequences. Um, but you're right, alexithymia is an issue. People think that about 50% of people with autism have alexithymia, and that aggravates their issue and then is often identified or, or made equivalent. I mean, people think that alexithymia is a part of autism, but some autism... Uh, I think particularly people with autism, they're, they're sort of against... Some people with autism are against that idea because they find it stigmatizing. But anyway, it, it, gets, it gets complicated. And of course, if you talk to psychotherapists, it gets even more complicated, right? Because there it is like, okay, you're trying to help people to recognize what they're actually feeling. But I think an interesting thing, if you think about psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, is that those professionals, what they're often trying to do is that they're trying to help people accept that they have ambivalent emotions. That's, that's a big thing in psychotherapy, and that's, it is okay. Because, of course, we all want to experience the correct emotion. And, you know, if we have a loved one, then it's, oh, we're well, so wonderful all the time, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then you're not really allowed to experience any negative emotions and so forth and so on, right? Which, again, is an interesting fact that I don't think is very well explored when we're thinking about mm -hmm. emotions. Okay. You don't want to ask another question because then you've got to be here for another <laughs> 20 minutes with me. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>